Uh, good morning, everybody. It's a delight to be here, and um, I, I'm always so glad that, um, on the whole, I know everybody, so you, you can relax. There's no ogres in the crowd, you know. You, you think, well, uh, you wouldn't be here if you weren't happy to listen a little bit. <laughs> but these next two sessions, you might have to listen a bit more closely. You're back in school, and um, I... I felt there was a very important subject to address and didn't realize it was going to get so big on me, but um, every now and again I feel I, it's just important and good for everybody if I fill the gaps in, in some uh, important areas of Christian thinking and understanding. And so we, we're going to be doing that a little bit in the summit. I was um, in a big conference in recent times. I mean, there were hundreds and hundreds of people there. The leaders of that ministry were terrific. And uh, that leader had something really wise and insightful and, and powerful and very instructive to say every session. He, he, he thought of it as his announcements and he kind of did it right at the start of the meeting. <laughs> and yet it was very good, profound stuff. And he built this tremendous ministry, but he had in numbers of speakers in. And um, I was one of them and um, but something came to light. One of the other speakers who, uh, they, they were all, actually, I loved them all. And um, one of them, though, had a very unusual gifting. And it was very, very powerful gifting. It, it was so powerful that he, um, he basically did just that one thing, but to the neglect of what else should have been thought through properly. And... Um, so he, it was a ministry of gifts uh, in particular. Um, he, he was warm, very friendly, very, um, we had some good interaction. I really liked the guy, but uh, um, he, the, the moment he took the platform, of course, he'd be so full of the Holy Spirit and barely able to stand and could hardly read and, and he'd get others up to read for him and people ended up drunk on the floor everywhere. And, and uh, so this was basically the thing he did, and, and it was a powerful gift and very useful in its place. But because he had um, put too much store in the one thing, uh, he, he made some um, errors of thinking. Because, because what happens is sometimes when you're very eager to promote a particular idea, you say things in favour of it to, to lift its status, not realising that some of the things you say have unintended consequences, you know. And uh, you think you're saying, you know, one thing, but actually the thing you say uh, <laughs> has other, you know, other outcomes. And uh, it's always best, no matter what we're dealing with, to stop and think about uh, in what ways, you know, it might be absolutely right in this way, but in what other ways might it be wrong? And so you then think about how to adjust what you're saying to take care of it. Anyway, so because this was a ministry of gifts and in particular encounters with the Holy Spirit, uh, he, um, because he's promoting the importance of that, he very much uh, undermined, just in what he said, value in teaching and in the Word of God. Uh, not that he wouldn't quote scripture, but he he managed to misquote it because he hadn't thought through the use of his words. So at the time I thought, uh, that's really interesting and I should ad address the subject that he, um, now could, nobody took any notice actually, but I noticed these things and, um, and I thought, no, there's an area there where the body of Christ needs some clearer instruction. And uh, of course that ministry as a whole was not taken you know, off on a tangent by that, and certainly not the leaders who um, were, were, were very much in favour of, of teaching. But you know, if you think it's all spirit, you can discount word, you know? And that's what was tending to happen with just the way this fellow addressed things. So without going into that too much, um, he, he misquoted Jesus. He said, um, he said, you know, Jesus said, the soul profits nothing. And of course, Jesus didn't say that. Uh, Jesus said, 
the flesh profits nothing. And so, and there were half a dozen things he managed to say in that session that, that made me realize that maybe anybody else realizing it, he had conflated soul and flesh. But they're, they're not only two entirely different things, they come from two entirely different sources. And the, the soul is actually highly important and um, the flesh is totally carnal. What Jesus said was, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. This is a more modern translation. But interestingly, he adds, the words that I have spoken to you are spirit. So it's words are very much a source of the life of God. Ah, there it is. How big does that get? Yeah, that's quite pretty. The... <laughs> So he had conflated the two. And the, the big difference is this. The soul was made by God. Man is a living soul. And it's, uh, well, we come to a bit more detail in a moment. He made it and he made it for himself and for you. And, and it's holy and it's, you know, meant to be fully redeemed. But the flesh came about because of the sin of Adam. And uh, the interesting thing is that, uh, well, you get interesting statements like this. Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord. So to say the soul profits nothing is a terrible statement. Not only that, the Lord speaks about his own soul. For example, of, uh, of those who shrink back, he says, my soul, God speaking, will take no pleasure in him. So it has a, it's a very important, it has a very important place in the construct of what a person actually is. So we're going to take a look at it. Uh, the, um, the next day, the same dear brother said, he, again, he quoted the Bible accurately and then he misrepresented the Bible in saying, Jesus never said, come to me and think. But he did say, come to me and drink. She was so busy trying to put the emphasis on drinking of the spirit that he went so far as to discount, if you took his words literally, to discount all teaching, all words and all consideration. But the Bible emphasis is actually more the opposite. Um, with regard to the statement, Jesus said, uh, Jesus never said, come to me and think. Is that true? Did Jesus never say that? Well, I can think of a scripture where he did say it, almost exactly. Come, he even uses the word come, come and let us reason together, says the Lord. So, so the errors, almost rookie errors, you know, can come from just not stopping to think, you know, a little bit further about the 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 carry on implications of what we say at times. So anyway, it, it seemed to me that it would be a good idea here at home to um, talk about um, soul and spirit and the difference between the two. And I discovered there was a lot of interest, but I didn't have time to do it before the summit. I thought, no, I'm going to do it on Friday morning at the summit just for the sake of all. Okay, let, help pastors think through this subject again too, get really clear in the mind. So I'm taking too long over all this, I'll never get the subject, better, better shove along. So um, we, get, we get into it. Look, we, we are made body, soul and spirit and you can't get away from the Bible declarations that this is the case. So in any, any way in which we come up with a description of how we are made and what it means to be made in the image of God and so on, has to really begin, I think, with uh, two statements in particular in Scripture. So first of all, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful and he will surely do it. So here's Paul at his, you know, insightful best, saying in terms of the whole person, it is spirit. You know, we, 
It, it rolls more easily off the tongue when we say body, soul, and spirit, but the Bible has it the other way around. Spirit and soul and body. And then to make an even finer point on the fact that there is definitely a, a clear distinction between, a difference between what your spirit is, the, you are a spirit being, what your spirit is, and what your soul is, We've only got to go to Hebrews 4.12 where it says, The Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit. In other words, as you mature as a Christian and the, and the Holy Spirit is at work in you and, and the Word of God begins to have its impact on you and you're a whole lot more prayerful about things, something goes on inside of you that makes you very much aware of the difference between the thinking within you that comes from the spirit and that which in you is, you know, your own rational processes that, you know, this gets less and less confused. Very important thing. But in the end, we, we need to say, no, we are a three-part being. Now, don't, don't rush to say, ah, I made the image of God because God's a three-part God. No, 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 no. That, that comparison does not stand. This, this, uh, this three-part makeup the Bible says we have um, isn't a result of God being Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That, that's a different thing altogether, especially when uh, the Lord says he has a soul too and chose to have now a human body. Nevertheless, we are a, so we're a tripartite being. However, don't make the other error of assuming that, that somehow we're three different bits because that's the other thing. You cannot separate the pieces and be you. These three things are so, uh, so much one, so integrated, so needing of each other, that only when it's all together are you really the man or the woman made in the image of God. But if we, if we take a lot of note of these three terms, body, soul, and spirit, put it the way that it rolls off the tongue more naturally. What do you do with these other words where you come across them like heart and conscience and will and mind and memory and emotions plus the self, uh, flesh, the old man, you know, where does all this fit? And some of these things can't actually be solely placed just in, in one part of us or another. And uh, the most obvious of the, the big questions of, well, where do you place that is the heart. And the Bible's constant references over and over and over to the heart. Well, I, I have developed what I think is, even if it's not um, the last word on the subject or not entirely accurate, or even if you think you've got a better way of doing it, uh, I think it's, it's helpful, it's practical, and it helps to explain a lot of things and it helps us to focus on uh, the, the really important tasks before us of, of addressing the issues of life. So um, I'm, we're going to, um, I, I developed some diagrams and with the help of Jared actually made them look good. So we, we're going to go step by step here. Um, there we go, we get a, a one second delay I'm told. Now. Let's start with you. Here's the person, man or woman, child. But uh, just for the sake of trying to um, understand the difference between these parts and their various functions, we're going to, um, this, how do we get this thing to move? Ah, there we go. We're gonna pull, pull these apart. Look, it's amazing what you can do with computers. <laughs> just pull them apart like that. So um, this isn't the right diagram here. What I want is current and next. Oh, that's so much better. There you go. Right, you ready to go? We start putting some stuff in place. Um, well, let's, let's start with this. Uh, can you read it? Is it big enough? A little on the blurry side, isn't it? Um, it's always, it's always been understood that the, in the soul is the seat of your intellect, your mind, rational thinking, and your will, of course, and emotion, and I put in there, because memory, 
and the self, big question over the self, but we just park it there for now. And um, so these are the functions of your soul, but if we go then and look at the functions of the body, we start to build these up, actually, yes, that's right. Um, the five senses, of course, you know, sight, hearing, touch, taste, smell. So this is uh, how you, um, you know, interact with the world, receive information about the world around you, plus memory. Well, we begin there, but there's more. Uh, there's a great deal the body does, and if we, if we take a look at this, and this is only a little bit, there's so much else you could add in. The, the body is hugely important because you've, you've got pain and adrenaline, and you, maybe you can put this all down to one of these five senses, but the gut, the gut is interesting because they talk about the gut as being a second brain. There's so much in it. There's a whole lot of decisions made by your body that you know nothing about. It's like you, your brain has outsourced a whole lot of stuff, but every now and again, the gut comes up against with a, a problem it can't solve, so it sends a message up to the brain, you, you think about this one, this one's your job. It's amazing what goes on in us, and you don't even know. Uh, and, um, and then you have chemicals in the body, and like we, I put fitness there, that's because you, know, you do a workout and suddenly you're happier and you feel better about life, and you know, there's more focus on it, you know, better motive, all that kind of thing. Sickness, the way that can affect the, the mood and the mind and the, and the spirit, uh, all your reactions to things. Uh, you, this is where you know, emotions cut in. You, you have an emotion, but the body reacts. So um, anyway, you could probably list a whole lot more things here in terms of what the Lord has built into you, and a lot of these are subconscious, but the body is hugely important. So then uh, you look at this, look at these uh, arrows here. You're, there's a whole lot of stuff that comes through the body into your thinking, your understanding, uh, your choices, your emotions, and, and, and your will, and, and vice versa. Attitudes you take, decisions, you know, get worked out through the body. You, you're, this, this is full on interaction. But then if we bring into that the spirit, um, functions over here. Now here's where it gets very interesting. I would put memory uh, in all three. Uh, I've read somewhere years ago that, that there could be a full memory of your entire life lodged in every cell in your body. We don't... You know, we're, we're amazingly made. Cells and molecules can be the most complex, complex things in the universe. It's astounding. But over here, now, compared to your soul, here's, here are functions for your spirit. So knowledge, you know, you'll have deep-seated knowledge your conscious mind knows nothing about. Uh, and memory, of course, revelation. That's where this breaks in. Um, of course, the Lord can come along and just speak straight to your mind as well. But, you know, if, if I'm praying about something and suddenly I see it, understand it, or suddenly I'm just flooded with a whole message to preach, this is all come by the Spirit. Holy Spirit through my spirit. I get that all the time. Uh, discernment, of course, you know, you're, you're feeling uneasy about something or you just sense, ah, oh, this is the way to go. This is your spirit at work. And then conscience. Now, this is the really big one, which is why I put in, in capitals. The Bible has quite a lot to say about conscience and has more functions than you might know. In our minds, we only put one function on it, but if you read the Bible, there's actually a bit more there, and I'll show you this later on in the session if I get to it. And then the thing we call the inner witness. And uh, this is where, you know, you're hearing truth, or something being preached, but you've got this real sense in here, whether it's truth or error. And the Lord's put that there, but this is, this is why you need to have a stronger spirit, a better spirit. You build your spirit up, because that's the other thing too, is it's, it's not perfect when, uh, in the beginning. You, it's meant to become something too, and there'll be emotion in there. How do we know, how can we say that? Well, your spirit can rejoice, you know? Or you can feel, you feel a certain amount of, um, you, you know, feel some, some fear or some, some dread or, you know. Um, I remember once I woke up in Chuck's house feeling a great dread about the airport we were about to fly to. I called them together, we prayed, we dealt with that, that shifted. But that was my spirit communicating important stuff to me. So as you can see, it's hugely functional. It's like for the Christian, hugely functional, but it's different to the soul. That's why the Bible talks about the Word. You, you need the Word of God. You need prayer to get a proper separation here. And look at the interaction. Look at these arrows. All the interaction that goes on. And, and yet you're only you when you put all that together. However, it, so it gets interesting here. 
This is where um, your, your spirit, you, you're designed this way because you, you have to live in two worlds simultaneously. You have to live in the material world and, and, and deal with a whole lot of things on that basis. It's real. But you also have to live in the heavenly realms. That's where you are. And it's not like you step into one, step into the other. Now, now as far as your consciousness goes, of sense of being in the spirit, yeah, that, that happens. But the reality is you're there all the time. You're in the spirit realm all the time. Stuff's going on around you, whether you know about it or not. That's why you've got to build yourself up in the Holy Spirit. You are a spiritual being as well as a material being, and you've been built so that you can fully 100% interact with both worlds all at the same time. Isn't that amazing? So over here's your spiritual interface, and over here's your material interface, and it's all in you, one person. And, and don't separate the bits or you've gone to kingdom come. Uh, no, because they can't be separated just like that. Now, having put that in place, we come to this, this area down the bottom to consider next. Because I said to you, where do you put the heart? And um, what do you do with all these scriptures that talk about your heart, having a good heart, or loving God with all your heart and with all your mind, or loving God with all your heart and with all your soul? Why make that distinction? What is this? So you're, you get to ask the question, well, is, is the heart another term for your spirit? Or is the heart part of your soul? It's in your soul. Or is it something else entirely? Is it a fourth part that Paul forgot to, he left it off his list because he forgot? No. No, you can't say that. Um, we've got to put that somewhere, but before we do, just something else I needed to say about the body and, and missed. Um, the body is holy. Every religion in the world and all the Greek philosophers thought matter was evil, the body was evil, and to be really religious, you know, it was to, it was to live above it, to aspire to be free of the material world and, and all this kind of claptrap. That, that is a doctrine of demons. Christianity is unique in saying the, the, the body's been made for holy purposes. It's the temple of the Holy Spirit. You will have this body for eternity. Now, admittedly, be a, it'll become a transformed body, but you'll never be without the body. And Jesus Christ has kept his body, bodily resurrection. And what happens in the body, you're going to be judged based on what happens, the Bible says, in the body. Hugely important. And if you think about it, Scripture says straight out, Christ appeared in a body. The crucifixion was bodily. The resurrection was bodily. The ascension appearances were bodily. And you yourself, if a surrendered believer, you'll be resurrected. Well, actually, everybody gets resurrected. But if you're a surrendered believer, you'll be resurrected with a redeemed body. So, so please be very clear. Uh, the material world is made by God and for God. Scripture is very clear, it was made by Christ and for Christ. And, and your, your body, it's, it's hugely important. And of course the body gets involved in worship. It's not just in the heart you worship God. No, you start to clap, you start to dance, you leap for joy. The body worships God, but of course it's not, not doing it, it's not a robot, it doesn't do it on its own. You are a complete person. So the, the whole of you, ha, you know, gets involved in worship. Um, hmm. Just before we move on to dealing with the heart, just a little note on sin and death, because this actually needs to be said. The, the unbeliever, the unconverted person, the person who's not born again, what's, what's their state in, you know, where do they sit in the, the affairs of things? They're very ob obvious here. They're, there's a whole lot over here on the left that's not going on. We've often said, we do say that they're dead in sin and they are dead to God. But don't make the mistake of assuming that because we say they're, they're dead to God or dead in sin, that the spirit is extinct or, or just out like a light, you know, been knocked out and needs to be brought to life. And yet, and yet it does need to be brought to life. And when you're born again, scripture says you are now a new creature a new creation. 
You've been born from above. Now, all this goes on over here in the spirit. So the unbeliever is very darkened over here. But interesting thing is, unbelievers still have a conscience. And it can be better informed or worse informed. I mean, Paul even talks about Gentiles who had who, who never had the law, but they had the law within themselves. And uh, so some, you know, some have that more than others. And uh, the Bible talks about a conscience in these unbelievers. So there's, there's some function going on there. The, the, the person, man or woman, wouldn't be alive if the spirit was dead dead. But death is actually a spiritual state, whereas we think of it in terms of a physical state. It's a spiritual state. So death is on that. So just a word about Adam's sin. Adam obviously was fully, fully with it, you know, um, had never fallen, but then he fell. And when he sinned, death came on him. And death eventually was to going, to, going to work its way all the way through from left to right. But this, this part over here, you know, it died. He, he was a, became a whole lot less sensitive here and progressively dying more and more. Their first reaction, of course, was shame and wear their nakedness. And then they hide from God. And, and I'll guarantee Adam wasn't instantly fully aware of all the ramifications. I'll guarantee that over the days and weeks and months, he step by step discovered all that he'd lost in terms of function, ability, power, authority. Uh, Jewish uh, tradition says that Adam ended up a very, very depressed man. Feel sorry for the poor guy, don't you? Because because his sins in us too, so we're very empathetic, you know. But um, so anyway, realization of all that came to him you know, progressively, I imagine. But I, I'm suggesting the spirit was not extinct, still had function, but was sure greatly disabled and so much blanked out and a lot of darkness in there. But he, here's this person lost in sin. Now we say about a sinner. And we say this about nice little old ladies who've, you know, never tortured a cat and, you know, like always been kind, uh, that, that if they're not born again, they are totally depraved. This is the doctrine of total depravity. In college where we were, well, a year or two before we were in, there was a, a famous anecdotal story of one of the mothers who had these two little boys. And apparently the, everyone else knew these two boys were just tyrants, you know, badly behaved, running around the place. But here's this mum sitting in the lecture on in the, whoever's teaching the doctrine, teaching total depravity of the soul. And she could not believe it of her little boys, little innocents, you know. No, it, this doctrine could not be right. You know, these boys could not be totally depraved. Well, they were, but even had they been, <laughs> but even if they'd been little innocents, no, the doctrine is still true. And it, it doesn't mean that everything in or coming out of the person is in itself terribly evil. What it means is that the fall of Adam and this curse of death and the resulting sin tainted every single part of the human being. There was, there was no part in it that had not been touched by death and sin. So it was all depraved when the scripture says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, this is what it's getting at. And it um, doesn't matter how short your ladder is, it's still not gonna reach the gutter, you know? Or how long it is, no, anyway, enough of that. Uh, however, at the same time, God can still speak to the unbeliever. This is a astounding thing. Here's Adam's sin gets into both Abel and Cain, and here's Cain full of wickedness and unrighteous thoughts and not at all pleasing to God, but God talks to him and he talks back. It, it just shows what can happen. And the truth is that the Lord is talking to hearts everywhere, preparing them, calling them, poking them, trying to get them to a place where even as a fallen sinful person, they can yield the will because it's this will that has to be yielded. It's the stubborn will of sinful man. Anyway, so how do we best understand this? Well, look, even the motor car you drive here today, whether it's a hybrid or not, the hybrids may be an even clearer example, but just your ordinary car that's not a hybrid one actually has two power systems. You have an electrical system and you have a fuel system. So there's a battery there and the means of recharging the battery and power is needed from that to start the car, but power is also needed constantly, the electricity that this generates, to do lots of other things. 
So if you don't have the electrical system working, you're going nowhere. And if you don't have the fuel system working, whether it's petrol or diesel, you're going nowhere. Your car has two power systems. And of course the hybrid actually has electrical engine and the, fuel, the petrol engine. But, but all cars do have two. And, and the hum you, you and I, we are like this. We have two uh, em empowering systems, life-giving systems, information systems, thinking systems. They're so fully integrated, it's one person, but you need it all. So, see if we can move on here a bit. Uh, interestingly, your spirit does more than you think. Paul's very clear. You can pray with your mind and you can pray with your spirit. You can worship with your mind and worship with your spirit. And the truth is, we're all doing both all the time, stepping into one, into the other, both at once, and, and don't always realize it. Speaking in tongues, singing in tongues, that's all part of it. So your spirit prays, uh, worships, speaks in tongues, discerns, communicates with the Holy Spirit, carries knowledge, brings prophecy, words of knowledge, special faith, the spirit of revelation, seeing in the spirit. Um, you know, Elisha says to the Lord oh, of his servant, Lord, open his eyes, suddenly he can see what was invisible. Uh, Abraham is looking for a city. He knows, you know, he, he, he knew it wasn't on the earth, but in his heart, he's looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. Moses enjoyed as seeing him who is invisible. You know, this is a really, really important part. It, you're a new creature. It's come to life when you're born again. However, dear friends, your spirit can be weak or strong. You, you can have a bound spirit. You can be a Christian with a spirit that's bound. Or you can be free. You can have liberty. It's very important that there's a full work of grace goes on in you but you're not going to benefit from it. You're not going to obtain it unless you give yourself boots and all to the Lord. Lord, I'm yours. Clean me. Read the words. Take in the word of God. Get busy praying because there is so much good that can go on in you. Position you better. Lift you up. Put you in a better place. All this stuff is going to go on. So here, for example, Ephesians 3, 14, 16. For this reason, Paul says, I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. What did Paul do to make this happen? Make sure he got hold of it? For this reason I bow my knees before the Father. Uh, great story I heard. Uh, you can ditch that scripture now. And, oh, yeah, okay. Um, after Chuck died, I, 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 I linked up with George Johnson in Vancouver, um, a man I'd come to know and love, and I mean, he just loved me. He wanted me there every year, and I was already doing that, and after Chuck passed, I wouldn't need to put in place spiritual covering and fathering, and I turned to George, and uh, along the way, and of course I walked with George then uh, about eight, nine, ten years until he passed, but he told me a story that uh, in his church, because a man called Dan Smith, he's still there, and Dan's a friend and um, businessman and, you know, really clear thinking man and a good man. And um, the story is that Dan and George had a trip planned to Europe to minister there, and they had booked flights. And it meant flying from uh, Vancouver across Canada, picking up a flight somewhere else, maybe New York or Toronto somewhere, and then flying to Europe. But a week before they were due to go, tickets already purchased and in the locker, Dan was feeling this unease, a, a strong unease, a deep unease about that travel plan. Felt quite, got quite troubled about it and talk to George about it and George says, oh, no problem, we're going to we'll change it then. They had to change it to a very inconvenient travel arrangement, but they did. The plane they had been booked on and had the tickets for and cancelled and weren't on was the plane in which uh, a, a cabin fire broke out somewhere over the Atlantic but not far from Halifax um, 
every, every soul aboard perished. Plane went into the sea. I think it was Swiss Air Flight 111. And um, in other words, the Lord could have spoken to George or Dan, but he, he put something into Dan's spirit. It's very important why we're prayerful. It helps us be in the right place at the right time. It helps us back out of things we shouldn't have been in in the first place or not get into them or push on a door that looks locked but actually it's unlocked. You know, things very, very important to be a spiritual people. Well, in the light of all of that and before we, before we move on to fill our, uh, our graph in a bit more, let's read this scripture. One, Psalm 139 13 to 16, for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made and wonderful are your works. That's the great line, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. You could take that and just apply it to the human body. The human body is so astounding. But there's all this. My soul knows it well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance in your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. Before moving on to uh, what we do with this green section here, the heart, uh, I want to say some things about the conscience up here. And the best way to cover it is simply to show you a series of scriptures. Now, these are not all the scriptures. I was actually surprised how many scriptures there were that referred to the conscience. So just to give you an idea of uh, the, the important nature of this, let's just, re- just take a look at these few. Uh, Romans 2, for when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness. So yes, a conscience at work in the unbeliever. But um, Acts 24, 16, now Paul's speaking of himself, but he actually says this in several places, makes this point. He says, I always take pains to have a clear conscience. Every one of us must do this, both toward God and man. So uh, that's an interesting statement. A conscience toward God, a conscience toward people. 1 Corinthians 8, 12, sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Um, I don't have time to stop and kind of extrapolate most of this. 2 Corinthians 4, but we have renounced disgraceful underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word, but by the open statement of the truth, this, this is a most interesting scripture we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience. Now, all of a sudden, conscience, we see, has another function. And this is much more like what we call the inner witness. So what we've always called the inner witness, yes, we have one, but it's provided by our conscience, it turns out. This is not the only scripture like this. So your conscience, if, if you're careful to maintain a clean conscience, you're far more likely to be able to discern between truth and error when you hear it. You can't pollute the conscience by denying it and pushing it down and not putting something right that you shouldn't have done and expect to be the spiritual man or woman or the clean person or the person that discerns truth and error or keeps yourself out of danger because you're hearing the spirit. All this, all this interacts, this is hugely important stuff, Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.11, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are known to God, and I hope it is known also. Oh, no, sorry, reread. But what we are is known to God. So here's Paul saying, we're an apostle, we're an apostolic ministry. Uh, You know, my responsibility is to correct you when I need to, lead you where you need to go. So he's saying, well, what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known to your conscience also, once again, another form of that inner witness of the Spirit. 1 Timothy 1, the aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. I was surprised by this scripture because it's saying that love, 
a, a better love, a purer love, a larger love, comes from three things being in better order. Issues from a pure heart, which we haven't spoken about yet, and a good conscience and a sincere faith. So if you want your love to be, to be uh, full and growing, if you want your love uh, motivated by pure motives and not unclean ones, um, all these bits are important. 1 Timothy 1, this charge I entrust to you, Timothy, my child, in accordance with the prophecies previously made about you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. By rejecting this, some of my chip wreck of their faith. Uh, how much more will the blood of Christ, Hebrews 9, through the, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works? And finally, I like this one, baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection. So as I said before, your conscience can be weak or strong, bound or free. Very important that your, your spirit. And, and the last word on conscience is this. There's something even worse from having a bound spirit or a weak spirit. Or, um, and that is a seared conscience. Seared. Here's what Scripture says. Now, the Spirit especially says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teaching of demons. Through the insincerity of lies whose consciences are seared. The, 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 the analogy here is, is like branding. Well, you know, you know what it means to sear anything, is to seal it off. You get a scar, it's hard, it's not flexible. And it turns out you, it's not a great state to be in when your conscience is seared, you're really, you're really locked out. Um, you've been, you, it, it's the effect of a hot iron on skin. Anyway, the, um, there's, there's time left for me to deal with the thing I would, thought we'd never get to, and that is the, the heart. Um, let's go through a couple of steps here. I, for the sake of the diagram, I'm putting the heart there, not as something separate from spirit, soul, and body, but, but, it, it, but it's something that seems to derive from all together. It's an expression uh, I'll come to define it a bit more in a minute, but the heart of man, if you're unredeemed, unsaved, here is the old man, here is the body of sin. But then, if you, um, if you have the new heart, look now, instead of the old man, you have the new creation, and you have a heart of flesh instead of the heart of stone, and baptism washes away the body of sin that was in the heart. The Bible says specifically that's what it does, even though we understand it little. But you've got to locate this somewhere in the person. So we move on. Um, this next slide, just down at the bottom, more changes. What we're saying we have now in the new heart is we have the new man who's a baptized believer. And something is going to go on in here a whole lot better than it went on for the unbeliever. Now, I've, um, here's a couple of scriptures. Thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart. Now, why would it say that instead of saying from your spirit or from your soul? It says from the heart you've become obedient. And then in, in, the psalmist says, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel in the night also my heart instructs me. And then he says later, Psalm 16, uh, verse 9 this time, Therefore my heart is glad, and my, and my whole being rejoices, my flesh also dwells secure. So it raises the question, what is the heart? Is it just another term for the spirit? Is it another term for the soul? Is it a function of the soul or of the spirit? Or 
is it its own thing like a fourth bit or something greater than them all? Uh, I've pondered this point long and hard and um, I have decided for myself anyway that probably the best way to understand it is that the heart is most probably the reality of, of at, at bottom, who we really are when all this functions together. You either got a good heart or you don't. Good values or you don't. That somehow you, it is the sum of your parts, if, if you like. It's just like a motor car, you know, whatever it's all parts on the shelf, it's not a car. But you put those parts together, it's something now that it wasn't. In other words, it's more than the sum of its bits. And so are you. You, you're one complete whole person and, and out of that comes the real person, the real, the, your, your real consciousness, your real togetherness. And at, at the bottom of that, see it's not just personality, at the bottom of that is this thing called the heart, what really is there. Anyway, look, for good, right or wrong, better way of understanding it or not, for me this is a practical way, a useful way of getting a grip on what this thing is. So. Um, hmm. we, a couple of things I need to say. Overall, you overall are the result of all the thinking, the attitudes, the loves and choices that have been repeatedly built into you, your mind and it's also the, the, the including of your reactions to life's experiences. So you, 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 you become full of choice and desire and value and attitude and these can either come from the wisdom that's been built up in you bit by bit over time that comes from you having a redeemed created spirit in fellowship with God and also from the inner presence of the Holy Spirit and also from the instruction of the Lord or it can be on the other hand, uh, you know, your heart just the foolishness and evil that's built into the fabric of your being from what you think and see in this world. So in other words, you can either take in the Bible and good books and prayer, or you can take in stupid movies and unclean evil things and pornography and everything else. All this is going to determine in the end the real you. And so um, I think this is a good way to think about that. And um, it's, in the, it's in the heart that secret sin is loved. Uh, that requires prayer to change. Here's an interesting one too. It's also in the heart that you have a longing for things. These are good desires, not bad ones. Obviously there can be bad ones too, but there's a certain class of thing that goes on in the heart that the Bible calls the desires of the heart that God honours. And, and you often hear a story the like of which, um, you know, some young mum sees shoes in the window of a shop and she can't afford them, but she loves them. So there's a longing in, in the heart, if you like, a desire of the heart, but she, she parks it to one side because it's out of reach. But the Lord has said repeatedly, he desires to give you the desires of your heart and he will, he will so often work to bring you into something that was impossible for you. So it's amazing that that the Lord so respects. That's why I have that little red car of mine that I run around in. For 40 years I admired those things but never ever thought of having one. All along the Lord had planned to give me one. It, it, it was in this holy section of the desires of the heart that the Lord honoured and, um, and wanted to do something about. So um, I've probably said enough about all this. There's plenty you can say but uh, anyway, seeing the heart is built up either into holiness or into evil. This, this becomes so much part of you. It's your character, it's your values, it's your motives, even your personality. This, this functioning of spirit, soul and body becomes built up into this thing we shall call the heart, which now is the real you. This is now the total person, the sum of your parts, what you are deeply at base. You, you, we start to think very seriously about, oh, what do we put in here? What do we take in through the body, the sight, the hearing, the touch? What do we choose? No wonder the Bible says, keep your thoughts on Jesus, keep your eyes fixed on Christ. No wonder he said to me, keep peering into the eyes of Jesus Christ. You become filled with what you look at and what you think about. 
Hugely, hugely important. Anyway, this is why we get a scripture like Romans 12, 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercy of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice. So that's bodies presented, wholly unacceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. That's one. But here's two. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And this is what's meant to go on. We're meant to get this this, this new man within the new creation, you then, the, you then start to build up your spirit in the knowledge of God, being, getting filled with the Holy Ghost, all this stuff coming more and more alive, and then you, your spirit is meant to inform your soul more. It's in the soul you can do all this rational thinking, and that's where the will is. Um, some people are willful, some people are stubborn and strong-willed, some people are weak-willed, some people are double-minded. The will is a hugely important part of the human being. This will is meant to be surrendered to Christ and in so surrendering the will, you develop a heart and a mind in the soul that will really listen to what your spirit is telling you and what the Holy Spirit is telling you. So, so that you're meant to become a slave of righteousness, but you need all of this part over here informing you in righteousness. So this new heart has got to learn. So some, we're talking now about the need for the transformation of the soul and, and guess what happens? Because they all interact with each other, all talk to each other. But, but as far as the new heart goes, most of the input, you see the number of arrows I've put, two from spirit, two from body, four from soul. Most of the input into your new heart comes, comes through your thinking and your choices. You think it through, you believe, because the idea is the things you believe here consciously aren't your values. You, you, but you've got to live and dwell with enough, choose it enough, this is your choice. Choose to love that it, it gets seeks right down into the heart so that, that you have deep-seated values that are good. That this, this, is, this is where the good stuff is. So um, look, what to, look what develops in the heart once, once this process gets properly underway. So now, now in this, the heart, uh, starting with the new heart, but now this is your heart. The, the values are there, the ethics, your, your pure motives, your faith, love, of course, peace is there, desires, holy desires, joy, hope builds up, courage, humility, generosity, and you could probably list 27 other things, there's no room on the graph. But these were just things that stood out as obvious to me in first consideration. So most of the input to really build you up as a person is going to come through thinking, and this is why the Lord says, come, let us reason together, says the Lord. It's why preaching is important. It's why you must sit under the Word of God. It's must, why you must read the Bible. It's why you must pray and seek the Lord, because this is a hugely important process that goes on inside the Christian. So, hope all that wasn't too dull. Um, we're about done. Oh, look at this one. This one, this just goes back to reiterate this. It's the arrows on the bottom here that are new. So what happens is, let's, let's assume that out over here is a whole realm of the Spirit. The Holy Ghost, heaven, will of the Father, love of the Father, all the wonderful things. Plus, dealing, dealing with the fallen things, having authority. Everything in you, starting from this side, but building up as you go along, uh, <clears throat> empowers the, the whole being to interact, uh, interact with the spirit world. And the other way around, uh, you're fully equipped to interact well and properly and maturely and wisely with the, the other world you live in. So um, where do we get to? Ah, fearfully and wonderfully made. Isn't that great? Now, a quick look, just not spending any time on this, if you wanted to put that together in the simplest of pictures, uh, we, we could diagram it like that, if you wish. Uh, you know, soul and spirit all contributing together, all as one, but building up the real heart of the person. And sometimes we call that heart of the person, you know, their soul or something, but you know, it's, you call it soul, it's true. If you call it spirit, it's true. But it's, it's something, I, I think, that's greater than the sum of the parts. Um, so just remember your heart can be good or bad, it can be filled with love or hate, 
can love righteousness, your heart can, or love wickedness. It can be strong or weak, believing or unbelieving, holy or evil. Your heart can be pure or, or unclean. It can be courageous or timid and cowardly. It can be covetous or generous, peace-loving or bitter, caring or cynical and sarcastic, and so on. You've got you to guard the heart. The Bible says guard your heart because, you know, the ways of man are desperately wicked and who can, who can trust himself a fleshly heart can deceive anyone. Solomon's heart was turned away from God by his foreign wives. All very sad. So Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven, 37, and he said to him, this is Jesus, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, just to complicate it all the more, <laughs> but there you are. So, um, and of course, we all know God looks on the heart. He judges the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And um, so on and so forth. Now let me close with this scripture. Oh, hang on, what do we have? We have a few more arrows to throw in here. Uh, input from soul and spirit into the heart, but look at this. The fully mature believer, a whole lot of input comes from the spirit to the soul. And uh, here endeth the lesson. Kind of. We're going to re look at this one last scripture. Uh, if uh, John 1, John 3, and 17 to 21. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and truth. By this we shall know that we are of the truth, and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, oh no, yeah, um, God is greater than our heart and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. So here is the end of this session for me. David wanted to take over. Um, Anyway, look, I, there's one little more section to all of this. I'm going to add, um, we've finished with our graphic. So in the next session, I want to talk to you about, um, well, another thing, another aspect of all of this. So David, are you ready to come up? Hmm? Right. Uh, in which case, I'm going to pray Simple prayer here in closing. Morning tea will be on in just a moment. But Father, I, I thank you that you have made us for yourself that this life, though temporary in this form, yet we're made to live eternally. And I thank you for all that you've given to us. Thank you for the fine tuning of the human life made in the image of God. And we would ask, I would ask, O Lord, that you'd grant us all the more understanding, not necessarily of the complexities and technicalities, but of the, the things that we must take a hold of so that not only we ourselves walk with you accurately and all of that, but so that we can help those around us. Lord, for every pastor here, I ask your grace to so bring their people into the place of having a good heart and a glad and free spirit and a will that is submitted to the Lord and a, and a mind that is renewed. Grant grace to every teacher, every pastor, every preacher, every counsellor, to do these wonderful things in the aid of believers. Lord, strengthen the churches and purify all our people, we pray in Jesus' name.